It's a man. She's a man. Didn't everyone? Yeah, yeah. So I say greetings to all you revolutionaries. <laughs> when I was asked to present the trustee award to John Waters, I said, I don't know this guy very well, <laughs> but I admire him extravagantly. Nevertheless, if I come, I won't be bending down to pick up anything from the street and <laughs> <laughs> how, how can you not love a guy who says his own behavior is that of an extreme Catholic before the Reformation? <laughs> I admired John in the 60s and 70s before he abandoned his down and dirty tactics for just a minute, cleaning up his act in order to write hairspray. That was a 2002 commercial hit, and this enabled him to do what he really likes. Uh, I recall dancing in the aisles. I could dance then <laughs> at the opening night, and I was having a ball, and someone came up to me and planted a big, sweet kiss on my neck. It was John. <laughs> and now that the same-sex couples can marry, You'll be getting our wedding announcement. <laughs> Nothing is sacred to John Waters, who made Baltimore famous even before recent events. John says of his outrageous films and writing, mostly made at his own expense, self-produced, self-written, self-directed, independently financed. He says, Baltimore is if every person in the South moved north and ran out of gas. <laughs> of the time in New York where he finds us all inordinately normal. <laughs> His first film was Lady in Black Leather Jacket. I liked female troubles and desperate living. And his new one is Car Sick. He claims it is politically correct with a touch of joy. <laughs> I admire John. He represents the 60s, 70s bridge that also included people like Andy Warhol and his underground superstars. And nowadays, the late Andy Warhol is a multi-billion dollar business. But John Waters is the real thing. Woo! Woo! He's not fame driven. He's a real spokesman for, supporter, and guardian of fabulous misfits and those who live under the grid, so to speak. John is truly sweet. And Andy Warhol only appeared that way. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> gave us the most enduring and outrageous cross-dressing star 
ever in divine. Tracy Lords and his crybaby. And John gave the film roles, more than one, I think, to one of the most tormented and misunderstood women of our time, Patty Hearst. She met the challenge with tremendous humor because John just thinks everybody deserves a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. <laughs> I don't recommend that you go to Wikipedia and read John Waters' quotes. You might die laughing. <laughs> to keep people away from him when he's overwhelmed by popularity, he has been known to carry a book titled Lesbian Nuns. <laughs> <laughs> he said one of my favorite things that people praying in front of a man nailed to a cross is like being in a bad leather bar <laughs> John has a collection of 8,000 books he says if you go home with somebody and they don't have books, don't fuck them. <laughs> he says nothing is more important than an unread library. He also says something I just love. He said, contemporary art hates you. <laughs> Isn't that true in Dave? We can't tell shit from Shadow. <laughs> oh, she's sexy. John Muir, a cultural phenomenon, a treasure of free speaking people everywhere. You encourage young women to embrace their bodies. You didn't have to encourage the guys. <laughs> <laughs> and you have given a hilarious dignity, dignity to the most outrageous situations. Come up here, John. I hope tonight is a Mondo treasure that you have. Serial. 
here while I'm alone. Which enraged the studio executives, but it worked. One magazine and the latter magazine, the first gay magazines I ever saw was incredibly brave men in white in white shirts, black ties, and black suits who, who picketed with a magazine whose cover in the 50s was I am proud to be a homosexual. Uh, here tonight we're celebrating the best of gay and lesbian books, and I'm usually against separatism, but I always wanted to live in the gay ghetto. <laughs> and, and now that we've assimilated so much, there's no slum apartments left for me to move into. <laughs> Someone once said, and it wasn't me, and I wish I could remember to give them credit, but they said, is anybody really surprised when any English man comes out? <laughs> <laughs> Can't we say the same thing about writers? <laughs> Maybe all writers are queer. <laughs> Except for Carl Obey Canal Scar. <laughs> Maybe Norman Mailer, but he lived in Provincetown, who knows? Way he killed himself. They used to do that before gay live. <laughs> so many letters now we have LBG Day Tram. I'm bi. I'm glad you have a bisexual award. I know some gay people were against that. <laughs> bisexual people aren't closet queens. That's what everybody thinks. You know, some people are really lucky. Woody Allen said bisexuals are the luckiest. They double their chance for a date. <laughs> to go further. Next year, I'd like, I want a category that's uh, radical feminist. You know, sometimes I love lesbians who hate men. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe we had an asexual. Surprise for them. They call themselves aces. And they say, we're standing on the edge of gay acceptance. I, I try to imagine how people are discriminated for not being horny, but I like the idea. <laughs> We have a prize for autosexual people. These are people I didn't even know what this was. See, we have some here. That's people that prefer masturbation to sex with other people. I thought that was everybody. <laughs> but they tell me no, autosexual people are people that believe if they have sex with someone else, they've been unfaithful to themselves. <laughs> this is a new literary voice. We must encourage. <laughs> for recognition that I always was a writer, more than a film director. I, I wrote from the very beginning. The first thing I ever wrote when I was worked at a summer camp, and I wrote a horror story called Reunion, and every week I read a chapter of it, and the kids got more and more uptight until the last day of camp I wrote this hideous, gory ending. They all had nightmares. The parents called the camp to complain, and I'm still doing that. <laughs> direct a movie I didn't write. I wouldn't know how to do it. I did my journalism, my stand-up acts, my books. I'm a storyteller. I like to think of myself as, well, Uncle Remus. <laughs> I'm lucky. I can go to work in my underpants in the next room by being a writer. No writer's ever bored. Just watch people. I sit in the airport when a plane lets out and make up instant bios of every person as they walk off the jetway. Hates her mother. Left a bomb in the bathroom. You can make up stories about each person. And you know, a bookshop was the only real job I ever had, too. But once I worked for Gallup surveys, but no one would let me in the house because I was so freaky, so I just made them all up every week, which, which was a writing exercise. But I worked at the Provincetown Bookshop as a young man, and they told me that I could work there and I could have every book for free if I read them and sold them. So I got my own knowledge there. I was thrown out of every school. But, but that bookstore is still there, and the two owners only recently died. One was 95 years old. So I'd like to dedicate this award to Eloid Hansen and Joel Newman, who owned that shop. And without them... know who Ronald Furbank was, or Baron Corvo, or Jane Bowles, so, so they really were part of my education. I didn't 
read as a kid because of rotten book reports. I hated fucking writing them. And they used to read his, read his books I hate, like The Life of Benjamin Franklin. So it, 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 I didn't read until I discovered Tennessee Williams, and I was only about 12. And I thought, oh, there is something else. There is bohemia. So I'd go to the library and ask for Tennessee Williams, and they'd say, see, librarian. And, and so I would steal the books. But, but, work in the library, even if a child comes in and wants to read Naked Lunch and he's eight years old, if he's smart enough to have heard of it, give him the fucking book. <laughs> and then James Baldwin, he got me through, really through, through junior high and Grove Press. They saved my life. Thank you, Barney Ross. It really, when, when I would read Janae in Catholic high school, and they think, oh, isn't that nice? He was reading, and I'm reading about an education that they certainly knew I was never going to get. So I'd like to thank Lambda Literary Foundation. I remember the Lambda Rising Bookstore in Baltimore. It was really great, and they had it for many years. But thank you to this unironic honor, because it really is. You know, I'm proud to be a Phil Felder, and, and really, this award is like the Imperial Margarine Crown of Queer Royalty. So thank you very much.